All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. What up, everybody? This is our Thursday show, and Thursday is a great day on this show. And the events of this morning, even, play very well into what's happening today. So, uh, first, I want to welcome our consistent cast of characters. You know, every show needs a cast of characters. I'm sure you'll agree with me. And our cast is distinguished. There is no describing my love and respect for the people that I work with, the others in the band, the team. My love is boundless. <laughs> How about it for Kim McAllister, everyone? Yeah. Love her. Yeah. Why are you yelling? Uh, Kim, how are you? Also, you know him. You see him occasionally. He does it all. He's like a magician, really. He's the great Tony, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, Tony off of his uh, 15 jobs. Nice to have him in the mix. Thanks, Tony. So today, I was mentioning uh, what's happening. Big news out of the uh, the plea agreement that Sidney Powell has just met. You know her. Sidney Powell is the Trump attorney. Look, Sidney Powell, I'll remind you, was with Donald Trump watching the election returns in the White House on election night. Sidney Powell was in the belly of the beast. And no one served up a stinkier load of BS about the elections than Sidney Powell. It is a photo finish, I'd say, between Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani. With Mike Lindell maybe, a, you know, trailing a little bit. But I'll remind you, Sidney Powell's an attorney, as is Rudy Giuliani. So they are looking for legal ways at that time to overturn the election. And they, they're the, <laughs> do you remember Sidney Powell was, she was pulling these ridiculous, utterly absurd, manifestly stupid things about the election out of the air and then serving them up to the press. I mean, like the uh, sort of thing and, and, and to the courts as well, uh, that Venezuela had hacked into the, Remember the whole Hugo Chavez thing that she was? So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, bottom line is that she has pleaded guilty. Now, what is interesting to me about this, and again, that's why I say it's a great day on a Thursday to be here. What's interesting to me is what now happens? I have two questions for David Katz at minimum about Sidney Powell. One of which is, what does this mean for future testimony that she's going to offer? Was that part of her deal? Usually it is, right? So will she offer testimony that could be damaging to Trump, Giuliani, and others who have been indicted? And then the other is, was this too good a deal that Sidney Powell cut? Feels like it is. Feels like somebody who was setting those illegal election landmines and just trying to blow up the whole process feels to me like she got off early, uh, easily. But I will talk to David about that, and he'll give us uh, the story. If you're new, David Katz is a former federal prosecutor. His takes on the law and everything legal, insanely good. I think he's one of the clearest speaking, yeah. most objective legal analysts I've seen anywhere. Yeah, really good. And uh, he joins us on Thursdays on a regular basis. So he'll be in the second hour. At the same time, big SCOTUS ruling on ghost guns. I'll have him talk about that. Anything with the law, we like to offer to David Katz. And then, of course, the Donald Trump situation as well. I see. I'll put my credibility glasses on. Happy Katz Day. We'll be interested to hear his thoughts on Sidney Powell. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. You know, what's interesting with the whole Powell thing is they made a plea deal with one of the lower, uh, you know, one of the lesser charged people that apparently was allegedly involved with tampering with machines and such in Coffee County. 
And that was in order to get to Powell. And so that evidence goes to Powell. Now Powell flips and you think they're going higher up, right? So they've just been getting the flip, flip, flip all the way up the chain till they get to the big guy. Yeah, well, that's the idea, yeah. I guess, to get to the big guy. But it just, yeah. oh, man, the deals they've made are pretty, um, it feels like pretty good. I mean, she could have done some real time. And she's, you know, the, the reality is she's done a lot of stuff that's very damaging. But uh, uh, again. She's uh, a bad you know. guy. She's a bad guy. But yeah, you know yeah, what? Yeah, she's <laughs> it's still less satisfying to me to have someone like her in prison than to see Trump in prison. Like the day he is clad in handcuffs in an orange jumpsuit, if that ever happens, I will feel um, sad for the country, but also secretly joyful. Not so secretly anymore. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like whatever, Sidney Powell, whatever. But Trump yeah. finally uh, facing I, I, the music and being held accountable. Hallelujah. Bring it on. I have said this before, but just to reiterate, he's not going to prison. He's just not. I mean, you I, stop I mean, that if, right if, now. You stop that immediately. Now. <laughs> You're in timeout. That's mm. it. I cannot tolerate that. Well, look, you got a red cup today. Well, this you. red cup was uh -huh. mentioned to me in an email by the person who said, and I'm so sorry, I can't remember exactly who it was. It yeah. was a guy who said, you ought to auction off the the black Mark Thompson Show mug, mm -hmm. one of the official mugs that broke. It was a Where Are My Weed Smokers at mug. Mm -hmm. And it broke spontaneously on anniversary day, which was made it kind of eerie. Where are my weed smokers <laughs> at? Yeah. So... Uh, we may it was a party. Or, we were getting a little crazy, you know. I mean, or we're, it we're was the before we went on, even. Yeah. So, um, uh, speaking of that, I've got a question for you, Tony, in a second. Um, but I got the email saying he'd like to both buy that broken mug and mm -hmm. the red mug. Now, the red mug is something that we we just did. I just bought this red mug. And that's a sticker. I've told you about it before, but you yeah. can get the stickers in our merch shop. Getmarkmerch.com. Are you drinking and, that? You're drinking out of this mug today. Oh, no, it's terrific. This is a and great you're gonna, mug. Are you going to sell that mug that you've mug. been sl slobbering all over? You're going to sell well, that I'll, one? It'll be washed. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's also expensive. I think I paid over $30 for this wow. mug. Wow. Like $34.99. That's yeah, and a so fancy I, mug. Yeah, I like, I, like these, uh, I like these mugs. So anyway, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And uh, I may either... I want, still want to do that thing where we put it in a box or whatever. The, the box thing. You're yeah. going to be in charge of that, Kim. What I I would no. <laughs> well, all right. Ch -ch -ch -ch. I guess not. That was just an idea. Uh, the thing I wanted to ask Tony about, and then I do want to move on to the day's news because there's a news out of the Middle East. There's news from Joe Biden. I've got a lot of stuff to get to today. Um, and uh, there's news of uh, a billionaire uh, trying to attack homelessness in the Bay Area. This is the show that came originally out of the Bay Area. That's why we do a lot of Bay Area news. And kind of keep an eye on the San Francisco Bay Area. But we're happy to have people in from everywhere. Uh, Tony, I wanted to ask you if the Schwarzenegger and Morgan Freeman greetings, can you break them out? To I keep asking Albert to do it, and then he's not here the next day, and I have to start all over again. You put them in the compilation reel. Yes. Mor yeah. I wonder if we can just play, play them separately today. Can you, would that be maybe later? Because yeah, I haven't, I'm, I haven't I'm played sure them haven't, as so one-offs yet. Let me get back to him. Uh, yeah, okay. It's yeah, not yeah. a. Uh, it's not right now. It's not. Okay. A, it's not. It's not the right now. Um, Heather yeah. Kennedy says that mug does not come from regular stock. That's a great. I come from regular stock. Yeah, but it's not like Clarence <laughs> Thomas. You have to. Uh, you have to build your own. You gotta. You know. You gotta go to the merch store, get those stickers, and you can put them on anything. I just chose a mug, but uh, go for it. <laughs> The Mark Thompson Show. So uh, the president, I thought, was good in his remarks in the Middle East. I think it's a very tough spot because you feel a... I don't think you could know the situation in the Middle East, even from a cursory standpoint, not knowing all the ins and outs and X's and O's, yep. without your heart breaking for those in Gaza, those who are residents of Gaza who don't like Hamas, right? They are trapped in Gaza. And they have for the, been for their entire lives uh, and uh, likely to be trapped uh, as life goes on against this awful crew, Hamas, who've received 
that cruise received so much money from Iran. They received humanitarian money from the West, and it never goes into the Gazans. It goes into the pockets of Hamas and all. So you can't help but have your heartbreak for for them. But, wow, if your heart wasn't breaking over the incident that produced this entire conflict, most recently, the uh, slaughter of all those Israelis, uh, you know, Men, women, children, innocents, I mean, primarily innocents, uh, then then you don't have a heart. Yeah. So Biden has to do two things before he goes to Israel. He has to assess the situation. This is an, an ally of America, and they're about to do something that you know you're not cool with which is going into Gaza, there'll be a lot of civilian, civilian casualties. Now, he knows that, and he's not cool with it, I'm sure. But by the same, you can say, well, he's a warmonger, he's this, he's that. Yeah, yeah, even, okay, but I'm talking about the brutal reality, which is that Biden and his administration know they don't want to be on the side of those who are killing civilians. And that's what just happened. That's what prompted this whole thing. By the same token... He has to honor that alliance with Israel and the clear urge to do something. As a government, you have to do something. And what is that something without harming civilians? Is the Israeli methodology as to how they strike back, is it, is it flawed? Is it excessive? Is it, these are things that you can debate. But as president you are charged with having to address the world about what has just happened and address the Israeli people. So he goes to Israel, and I thought this was a courageous thing, he said. And, Tony, play this part of Biden, if you would, please, from his speech in Israel. Since this terrorist attack, terrorist attack took place, we've seen it described as Israel's 9-11 well, for a nation the size of Israel, it was like 15 9-11s. The scale may be different, but I'm sure those horrors have tapped into so, some kind of primal feeling in Israel, just like it did and felt in the United States. Shock, pain, rage, an all-consuming rage. I understand, and many Americans understand. You can't look at what has happened here to your mothers, your fathers, your grandparents, sons, daughters, children, even babies, and not scream out for justice. Mm -hmm. Justice must be done. But I caution this while you feel that rage. Don't be consumed by it. After 9-11, we were enraged in the United States. While we sought justice and got justice, we also made mistakes. I'm the first U.S. president to visit Israel in time of war. I've made wartime decisions. I know the choices are never clear or easy for the leadership. There's always cost, but it requires being deliberate. It requires asking very hard questions. It requires clarity about the objectives and an honest assessment about whether the path you're on will achieve those objectives. <clears throat> The vast majority of Palestinians are not Hamas. Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people. Hamas uses innocents, innocent families in Gaza as human shields, putting their command centers, their weapons, their communications tunnels in residential areas. Palestinian people are suffering greatly as well. They mourn the loss of innocent Palestinian lives like the entire world. I was outraged and saddened by the enormous loss of life yesterday in the hospital in Gaza. All right, now let's just stop right there. And, you know, it is in the shadow of that story of the hospital that he makes those uh, remarks and that reference. So first, I'll get to the hospital in a second. But first, I want to speak to what I thought was courageous. 9-11 produced the biggest foreign policy mistake of I was going to say my life, but I grew up with Vietnam. So Vietnam was the, I mean, I didn't grow up with the, I was just a kid, but I was, 
aware of Vietnam going on in my life. That was, that's certainly, but our Vietnam was Iraq uh, in some ways. The casualties and et cetera in Vietnam exceeded that. But the uh, bizarre mission statement and the, the loss of life, the loss of civilian life, the loss of money, the, the destruction of, uh, of Iraq in many ways, the destabilizing of the Middle East, my God, it was a, and you could see that coming. It was so clearly a mistake. But it was justified because of 9-11. And I thought the courageous part was to call that out. The America mistakes. Mm-hmm. America is ashamed, yeah. essentially, is what he's saying. It's implied. We're ashamed of what we did in the Middle East on the back of 9-11. Afghanistan, then Iraq. And the, the Iraq thing was just pure military adventurism. It was BS. It was crap. It was completely devoid of any legitimacy. And it was it was endless money and lives and all of those civilians killed. I wouldn't say it was a mistake. I would say it was calculated. They did it on purpose and lied on purpose about it. And there were people that knew that information was wrong about the weapons of mass destruction. But it was because they wanted to go in and do that. They invented a reason to do it it well, wasn't a, a yeah. we have a failure of of uh of intelligence our bad we're sorry you know th- it wasn't a, a real mistake it was a we made a mistake on the surface but underneath we did it on purpose i think it's a fair distinction you're making i do i, I guess what i think of is all of the conversations and arguments i had with people who were trying to justify iraq right um but you're you're right. It wasn't. It was a deliberate thing. But it was a. It was awful. And so anyway, I like that this U.S. president acknowledged that. And uh, I don't think you would find that from a lot of other U.S. presidents. Uh, I'm gonna put my credibility glasses on for a moment too. Stan Pollock, my favorite CPA. What up, Stan Pollock? Thank you for the ten spot. Just want to thank uh, you. Just want to say thanks, Mark, for your support of Israel. Of course, big shout out. Well, I do, out. I, I do support Israel, and I also push for the realities of the Palestinian people's situation improving in Gaza. And I really don't know how to how to come up with a strategy that really honors their plight, also. But I certainly. Uh, understand the Israeli situation. And I do want to, you know, here is a really good piece. I don't know if I can read it a little bit from uh, Tom Gunn. My favorite gun is the Tom Gunn. Thank you for the 10 spot, Tom. Big shout out. Appreciate that. Yeah, we're crowdfunded, so we try to give you the shout out along the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, Frank Bruni is a brilliant writer, opinion writer, and he's done a piece, and I just want to read you a bit of it because I read it this morning and I really liked it. Uh, he writes for the New York Times, by the way. And boy, the New York Times, again, I'll get to this. New York Times, Washington Post, they dropped the ball on the, and hugely on the hospital thing. In fact, let me speak to that quickly. The media has got to get its act together. Yeah, that's the truth. The idea that you could take a Hamas press release, essentially, which spoke to the destruction of a hospital and the 500 casualties and ride with that narrative front page. You rode with that narrative media. You rode with it in such a high profile way that the president of the United States referred to it in his comments. It turns out that we don't really know what the hell happened at that hospital. It seems clear that it wasn't an Israeli Bomb, although that's all in a gray area, too. There is a hospital there. It wasn't destroyed. There weren't 500 people killed. So you see how insanely wrong all this stuff in war can be. And I've said it before. The, you know, It's not my line. It's, it's the most quoted line probably about war. The first casualty of war is the truth. And you saw it in the first day. But the idea somehow that the media doesn't understand that adage, that they don't remember that, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Network News, 
because it gets clicks, it gets eyeballs, it's scary. Hospital, bomb, destroyed, 500 people dead. Oh my God, it is just what we expected. It's horrible. It turns out it's not true. It's outrageous. And then there's no real correction on the part of the media. They do a back step. They do kind of a hundreds killed, uh, unclear how many people were killed, unclear casualties. And indeed, we don't really know what the hell happened in that hospital. And let me just tell you what we do know and don't know. And then I'll read you the Bruni piece real quick because I think it's really excellent. So, in the hospital, oh, I hope I have it here. Stand by. I put it in the show, but doggone it. In the hospital, this is where people that have been told to flee, I think, were gathering for shelter. So, it wasn't just injured people there. It was people that were kind of taking refuge in the hospital. So, there were more people than normal in that building is what I understand. Video and photographic evidence, along with eyewitness accounts, are providing some clues about Tuesday's massive explosion at that Gaza hospital, which Palestinian officials say killed hundreds. Hamas blames an Israeli airstrike for the blast, a charge the Israeli Defense Forces have vigorously denied. Israel says that a Palestinian rocket launched by a Palestinian militant group called Islamic Jihad exploded in midair and fell on the hospital grounds. The U.S. believes Israel is not to blame based on analysis of, quote, overhead imagery, intercepts, and open source information. Social media is awash with claims and counterclaims of who was behind the explosion. According to Colina Koltai, a researcher with the open source investigative group that's called Bellingcat, quote, immediately it just became a very confusing situation. You have conflicting claims. All this footage, she says. Here is the available evidence of what we know so far. Many civilians, as Kim has said, had taken shelter at the hospital to avoid ongoing airstrikes. Hundreds of people, including families, who'd come to the hospital to hide from the bombardment elsewhere in Gaza. Israel had conducted thousands of airstrikes in the 12 days since a wave of attacks by Hamas militants killed more than 1,000 Israelis. Church officials and the Palestinian Ministry of Health say that Israeli fire had previously struck the hospital on October 14th. We don't know that that's true. Despite that incident, because the hospital belonged to the church, civilians thought the hospital was the most safe place in Gaza. That's what we were just saying. The displaced Palestinians were in a courtyard outside the hospital at the time of the blast. The small courtyard had several parked cars and a few grassy patches where people appear to have congregated. One video, a live broadcast feed from the news channel Al Jazeera, appears to show what could be a rocket launching from a site west of the hospital. The rocket, or other object, appears to break apart high above the hospital moments before the blast. The Israeli Defense Forces claim that radar data shows a barrage of rockets was launched from an area southwest of the hospital at the time the explosion occurred. While the geometry of the Al Jazeera video aligns with that claim, there's no way to independently confirm the radar data. So to review, Israeli uh, officials say, look, we looked at the radar data and based on the way that we've got it schemed out, there was a barrage of rockets launched from the area southwest of the hospital, and Al Jazeera video actually bears that out. But the guy in the hospital, Dr. Naeem, let's hear from him. He was in the hospital's operating room the moment the explosion occurred. He said after he heard the blast, he rushed outside to find horrific injuries to the people in the courtyard, including amputated limbs and vascular injuries. He also said that there were no deaths among the hospital staff, many of whom were working inside the hospital at the time. Quote, luckily none of our staff was killed, but we had two injured. Photos from the following day also appear to show little damage to the hospital buildings and a relatively small blast zone from the explosion. That damage pattern is inconsistent with a large airdrop bomb, which would leave a crater and create a shockwave that would damage or destroy surrounding structures. 
It's very clear to me, said a Netherlands-based nonprofit uh, military analyst, it's very clear to me that this is not an airstrike. Israeli bombs typically leave craters 3 to 10 meters in size. They're designed to create a large shockwave that propels shrapnel over a large area. The lack of both shrapnel damage and structural damage to the hospital is inconsistent with all types of commonly used Israeli bombs and artillery shells. Then you get to the death toll. Death estimates vary widely. They're believed to be in the hundreds. That is plausible, according to the independent review of the situation. This guy's investigated war crimes all over the world, says such a high death toll would be, oh, it'd be toward the extreme high end of anything I've ever seen. But it is plausible, he said, because everybody's crowded into a tight space. Uh, That's all we know, what I just told you. So I go back to the media. You guys run with that crap? You guys run with a totally BS story that you got right out of the email blast that Hamas sent out? Now, I'm not on, I'm not picking sides here, but I'm, I, I, I know I'm not on the side of this shock porn crap that the media is doing when it comes to what's happening there. It's awful enough without the media concocting stuff and going with whatever concoction comes through the editor's desk. I'm talking about major media outlets. This isn't Fox News Channel, you know, which is a major media outlet with a clear bias. Talk about the New York Times, Washington Post. It was ever, everywhere. And as I say, the president referenced it. So uh, that's what we know. I just feel as though the media has really dropped the ball. Look, the media has Jim Avila talked about this. Avila mentioned the fact that there's nobody in Gaza and there's nobody even in that area. They have most of their foreign correspondents now with all the cutbacks the media has had to endure. They've got them living in London, maybe. NBC has one guy who does, I think, either live in Israel or close by. But I would really watch what I hear because I do believe the clickbaity nature of what we're getting out of this area informs the narrative in a perverse way. It is bad enough, as I say, without having to go all clickbaity on it. So I'll return to it. I do want to read you the Bruni piece, but... Maybe I'll wait on it for now. I feel like we've done enough on it for now. But um, And you'll let me know if there's anything I need to see in the chat. Right, Kim? Yeah. All right. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. What do we want to do, Tony? You're the grand poobah here. Looks like it's time for news. All right. We'll do news. Smash the like button like a boss. Smash it with your iron rod. I'll remind you we'll get into a full analysis with former federal prosecutor David Katz about the Sidney Powell plea agreement that just came in this morning. Also, what's happening in Donald Trump's... (laughs) Donald Trump... Did you see what happened in his fraud trial yesterday? Let me just real quick tell you this, and then we'll go to Kim. So yesterday, in Donald Trump's fraud trial, you know, he meets the media outside. He has his media moment. Reminds me of the old People's Court show, you know, where... Doug Llewellyn used to talk to the... Bum, bum. Yeah, bum, right, bum, exactly. Bum, bum. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think of the decision? Well, I'll tell you, that guy better not come onto my property again. Otherwise, you know, it was, it's that kind of thing, right? So Trump is outside. I, um, I have it here, and let me, um, let me find it. What he said, essentially, to the media was he, he lashed out, right? He said, I, um, Trump... Is lashing out, right? He says, they want to keep me here instead of campaigning in Iowa. He's complaining that he has to be in in the courtroom. Of course, he doesn't have to be. They want to keep me here instead of campaigning in Iowa. They want me to be here. Three minutes go by. Reporter asks, so will you be back here tomorrow? Trump, probably not. We're having a very big professional golf tournament at Doral, so probably not. Yeah. You know, one moment outraged. Yeah. God. (laughs) Unreal, man. That guy was president of the United States. What a messed up country this is. Um, 
All right, smash the like button smash like a boss. It with your iron rod. Uh, but Katz will be along with all forms of legal analysis, so we'll get that going uh, beginning of the next hour. Mark Thompson. Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister. The war between Israel and the Palestinian militant group Hamas is now on its 13th day. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said yesterday this war won't be a short one, and he asked for continuous support. The Israeli Defense Forces say that 203 hostages remain captured by Hamas. The Senate will soon consider a $100 billion, with a B, dollar funding bill for... Israel and Ukraine, as the two nations are both at war, not with each other. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell signaled that he supports this package, saying the U.S. has a responsibility to help defend its allies from authoritarian forces seeking to undermine the West. The supplemental request expected to come from the Biden administration before the end of the week also includes funds for Taiwan and for the U.S.-Mexico border. Meanwhile, President Biden is scheduled to speak to the American people from the Oval Office this evening at 8 p.m. Eastern, and he is expected to explain why the conflicts in Israel and Ukraine are vital to U.S. national security. This will be the only the second time during his presidency that President Biden has addressed the nation from the Oval Office. Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan will not be seeking a third vote to become the Speaker of the House today, coming after he failed to get the necessary votes from members of his own party during two rounds of ballots earlier this week. Jordan is reportedly not dropping out of the race, but will back up plan to empower interim Speaker Patrick McHenry until January. So this will give him some time to shake down other people and intimidate those who haven't come to his side and supported him Speaking we'll talk more about which, that but well yeah. i will want to tell you yeah. you called it you called it two days ago you said it right here on the show you said it again yesterday and here it is representatives drew ferguson of georgia and marionette miller meeks of iowa are among a number of house republicans who say they received death threats over wednesday's vote for speaker of the house the two lawmakers pulled their support from ohio congressman jim jordan in the second vote congressman Congressman Don Bacon of Omaha and Nick LaLotta of New York also voted against Jordan. They also say they've received threats. Who did the threats come from? Can they be tracked back to Jim Jordan's folks? We don't know, but you called it. You said, Mark, that, you know, that he's full of intimidation tactics. And it seems like, you know, he's trying to force people into it with threats. Yeah, I mean, he he really is. uh, He's a bully and he will get what he wants by bullying or he won't get what he wants in the case of this um in the case uh, i think of what's happening with the speakership he was just not going to get it Uh, uh, it's it's weird though because in the new america you know bullying and trying to shame people on social media and this kind of uh, uh call for intimidation actually can get you pretty high up in political life a lot of people are scared of American politics. I mean, to serve within American politics right now. They're leaving because they're frightened. That's what GOP legislators have said across the country. So anyway, Jim Jordan, yeah, this is right out of the Jim Jordan playbook, which is all intimidation all the time. Crazy. And you know what? The fact that you saw it coming and that you knew it, what does that say? You know? Thank you. It says that I'm amazing, uh, Kim. And then oh, I, is that what I, it says? Who I, am? Oh, yeah, yeah. Kind of I was deal. thinking it, you know, really laid a statement of what's going on in America today. But hey, oh. you are amazing. So you know. I, uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's well, all right. I, all right. Kind I, of a big uh, deal. What? I get it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Walmart and Aldi are lowering prices for Thanksgiving foods this year. Walmart's president and CEO saying in a statement that it will remove inflation from a range of foods this year, saying the company is building on the investments they made last year, knowing they need it now more than ever. Aldi is also cutting prices down on more than 70 holiday food products. So maybe there will be a Thanksgiving dinner after all, little Timmy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) A New York woman is thanking several Long Island railroad workers for returning a bag that she left on the train. What do you think was in the bag? 
Uh, nothing valuable. <laughs> well, you That's would why be. That's they returned it. No? No. Mm -mm. Wow. Juliet Barton says she got off the train to make a stop and forgot her backpack, which contained $12,000. Oh, my God. How do you forget <laughs> that? Oh, no. How do you forget a backpack that, that contains $12,000? You just, your mind is on other things and you walk away from the money. I don't I know. I am telling you that is, uh, so they returned it? You can buy her a Movado watch <laughs> in Sam's. That's right. Her loss took her all the way to the lost and found at Penn Station, where she got help from several of the Long Island Railroad workers who eventually. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> exactly. I would think that's what they would say. <laughs> Sorry, kid. You left Sorry. it on the train. Can't find your bag. No, they did eventually find her bag the next day. So she had to go 24 hours without knowing whether her 12 grand was going to be returned. Wow. The uh, MTA chairman presented commendations to the employees with Barton saying it's not about the money. It's about the combat compassion that they showed her. No, it's also about the money. Yeah. Well, that's really nice. That we have processes and protocols. And <laughs> and, well, I guess they did. She went to the lost and found, and they returned it. My question becomes: How much of that twelve k did she break out to the guys who returned it? Does it say? Right. No. No. It doesn't. How much say. of the twelve thousand would you no. break out if you oh. got it back? Well, is it my money or is it my employer's money that I'm taking to the bank? Like, what's the money for? If it's my money, I'm giving each of them a thousand and saying thank you. Unless, like, I have a mortgage payment that costs that much money. I don't know. Unless I'm, like, hard well, you up. Ba you backed off from that reward in a hurry. Unless, well, unless my unless... kid's sick and I need to actually, yeah. look, okay, we will work it. 500 for him, 500 for her. Okay. Well, wait a minute. I've got a house payment. All right, look, 250 for you. We're going to give you 500 for the two of you. Wow, this is getting to be a worse deal all along. The, um, oh. If it's your boss's money, you... I think you still got to knock him down something because yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's really lovely. Yeah. yeah, that's good. And the, but maybe they're public employees that can't take a tip, and so they have to say no, thank you. Oh yeah, and then I, you um, get to walk away with your twelve grand at the pet store. They can't take <laughs> tips, but they help me with because I got like you know I've got cats and stuff. We have yeah. uh, lots of cat litter, right? And it's like forty pounds each bucket. Yeah. So I've got, and I go only, I don't like to go to the store a lot. So I go once and they're like all these 40 pound buckets of cat litter. <laughs> so when the person helps me out to the car, they're not allowed. So I, I give them a tip, even five bucks or whatever. Sure. And um, they said, no, 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 we're not allowed to take a tip. And so I put it inside of the trunk. Okay. Like, so no, we can see it. I put it on top of the bucket that's inside the trunk. Now the trunk is still open. Yeah. And I said, here, you can just reach in there and get it. And that's how we do it. So okay, so all, they do take the tip, but in a secretive they're, way. They're all there's always a way to take care of people. I think my yeah. grandfather used to do the old fashioned. He would put the money in his the palm of his hand and offer a handshake and do I the love transfer that, too. that way. Yeah. Absolutely love that. That's like you're right. That is old school, man, and I love it. It's still great. So handshake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the so Italian clumsy. Handshake. I could never pull that off, but he's like, you know, he would do it. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. Um. Lastly. A city in Utah is ordering the removal of a raunchy Halloween decoration display. You know, you can't go too crazy with these things. People are going to complain. This one, especially in Utah, this one is located on a residential street at the corner in Grantsville, west of Salt Lake City. The display consisted of a life-size skeleton hanging upside down from a street sign like a stripper on a pole. whoop de woo Wow. City officials say the display violated a city code that bans residents from attaching anything to street signs. In response, the resident removed... What are the removed... porn stars doing, Mark? <laughs> Well, I guess they're, they're, I guess this is the porn star of uh, skeleton. That's right. You don't have they, a picture of it, Kim? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have the <laughs> skeleton. No. Uh, in response, the resident removed the skeleton from the street Kim, sign yeah. and then attached it to a pole right in their front yard. So, oh, that's just so good. They're so pulling good. an Albert, doubling down. You don't yeah. like it? Well, that, guess what? <laughs> front and center very, for you. That is very Albert to do something like that. Yes, yeah. yes, it is. Um, remember that, I think it was in Santa Rosa last year, they had this display of, like, I want to say, 10, 15 skeletons, and they were all doing different things. And in some areas, the skeletons were having sexual relations. 
Wow. And and residents complained that their kids were walking by, seeing like you know one skeleton yeah. behind another, shall we say? And, and well, you know, <laughs> little Johnny, asked- someday you'll grow up to be a skeleton, and then you can have sex with another skeleton. <laughs> That's how it works. Oh my god! This report is sponsored by. Tenuta Vineyards. Yes, Woo-hoo. it is. Woo! We love the wine, let me tell you. And at Come for the t- wine, stay for the friendship. <laughs> at th- give them 30 minutes, you'll be friends for life. That is mm-hmm. the saying at Tenuta. And at Tenuta, you have a special exclusive Mark Thompson deal at 10% off across the board. Is it time to restock your wine? Might be. Mm-hmm. Tenuta Vineyard is in Livermore. They have great events through the fall, this month, and in November as well, they do a grape stomp. Great fun and really nice people out at Tenuta. The Mark Thompson, why are you yelling red? Really among my favorites. I'm sure the white's good too, but you know, I like the red. You're a, you're a red person, apparently. <laughs> you like the red. Okay. Yeah. I that's do okay. Like no, that's what I mean. You're like the, why are you yelling? You like I the like why are you nice, yelling red? Yeah. I like a nice rose sometimes on a hot day, but mm. I, this Mark Thompson, why are you yelling red? You can't go wrong with it. Mm-mm. It's true. It's I like so the, good. particularly at the holidays, I like mm-hmm. a little uh, white wine sometimes. To which one of yeah. you is Mark Thompson? Hey, which one of you is Mark Thompson? Pinot Grigio is very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. To get your 10% off, you just need to call Rich at Tenuta and say, Smash it with my, your iron rod. I was waiting is? for you to play the drum. Oh, I don't yeah. know how you do it with your, with your iron, iron rod. Yeah. <laughs> and you can call him and say that at 925 699 4576. I'm Kim McAllister. This is The Mark Thompson Show. <laughs> They had to close down an entire radio station to silence him. And now, he's here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Thompson. The Mark Thompson Show. Who's Mark Thompson? When they raided Mar-a-Lago, God didn't like that. Oh, yeah, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm Mark and Kim and Tony's here, and we are a crowdfunded show. We took this show from radio, and now we live here on the YouTube platform. We're also podcasted across all major podcast platforms, so it's really cool to have you in the mix and uh, as uh, Kim was saying, smash the like button. It costs you nothing, and that's a smash that's it a great with thing. With your iron rod. Next hour, I'll res- I'll uh, recognize some of you who have joined us through Patreon and PayPal. Really appreciate it. And there's Kathleen Marshall with a super sticker for ten. Big Come shout on. out. Big shout out to Kathleen Marshall. Yeah, we have super stickers and super chats live with a super sticker super chat uh, thing that super sticker <laughs> and super chats you. Brian says, for 18 bucks, first of all, big shout out. Big shout out. Thank you, Mark, for your support of Israel and playing Biden's brilliant word for us. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I thought he was, he was very good. And I, I think cautioning against the rage and the vengeful instinct that you have to have. I mean, I think it's just human. Um, I think that was courageous. And so uh, I give him credit for that. Uh, Wes for five. What's up, Wes? Big shout out. Regular. Hey, um. Thanks, Wes. Yeah. I'm going to, um, quickly, uh, give you something that's, uh, not quite as heavy, but it's sort of wild and it speaks for the, uh, the time we're in. The Mark Thompson Show. Is it better than skeleton strippers? Mm, It's different. Kind of in the same, uh, not real, my. (laughs) <laughs> Skeleton strippers, by the way, uh, Tom noted, uh, you can tell your kids, where do they think little skeletons come from without the, uh, yeah, I think that's a very. It's funny. Yeah. Uh, 23 and Me hacker leaks 4 million stolen DNA profiles from customers. This is why you don't do the 23 and Me. You keep your DNA to yourself. This uh, British ancestry um, uh, group, because it happened in Britain, um, is apparently including the royal family. 
Um, this is, and then there's, of course, Israel folded into that as well. I mean, just that they're <clears throat> not supporting Israel, whatever. A hacker has released millions of additional genetic profiles stolen from DNA testing firm 23andMe, claiming that the leaked database includes members of the royal family and other notables with British ancestry. Where's my um, British person? That... Thank you so, so much. Thank you. That's it. Right. And uh, also the processes. We have processes and protocols and, and standards. standards. Apparently they weren't being maintained at 23andMe. The hacker used the moniker Gollum, published the genetic profiles on the cybercrime marketplace breach forums. My precious. The hacker claims, right, good <laughs> Gollum impression. Uh, the hacker claims that they are angry at Israel and its supporters, and that's why they're leaking this. Okay, really? The uh, data set includes 4 million 23andMe customers who have ancestry in Great Britain. Gollum, again, the hacker, says the genetic profiles include wealthy families serving Zionism. So it really is an anti-Israel move. Yeah. Um, but it's still a pretty massive breach of 23andMe. Always makes you wonder. Apparently the hacker says some of the uh, the information they have is on the royal family. Yes. And you exactly. know, there's been questions all along. Who oh. really is the father of, of Prince Harry? No. If you subscribe to all that, you know, maybe Diana did the deal with somebody else. Oh, yes. Her bodyguard or whatever. But, yeah. I mean, whatever. But if the 23andMe info is released and it shows something scandalous, that will mm. be yeah. interesting. Burt Young has passed away, everyone. Does everybody remember Burt Young? I'll bet that Kim doesn't. She recognizes his face, she told me. Yeah. But she doesn't quite recognize the name. Burt Young, do you know the movie Rocky? Yeah. Okay. Well, all the Rocky movies. That's Burt where I recognize Young, him from. Yeah. He was, uh, yeah, he was in the boxing movie Rocky, and it was a really important figure. He was 83, no cause of... Uh, his passing is posted. And uh, he was in more than 160 film and television credits, including Chinatown, Once Upon a Time in America, The Pope of Greenwich Village. He was an ex-Marine and former professional boxer. And he parlayed this kind of, you know, uh, what would you call it? Tough guy, sort of street guy uh, essence into a really successful Hollywood career. On he was, television, he had roles on MASH. Um, he was in Cinderella Liberty. Uh, and, uh, and of course, he was such a big part of the yeah. Rocky franchise because he played Paulie, who was the brother of uh, Adrian. Was it Adrian? Yeah. Look at him. That's Burt Young. Wow. You think of Burt Young as the corner person in Rocky. But that is Burt Young as a young boxer. Look at him. Wow. I mean, again, Rocky was such a perfect movie, you yeah. know? It was such a perfect fable or story, had just everything. It had, you had rooting interest, you had, you know, humble beginnings, you had this um, love interest that was with this. Uh, Talia Shire, who was, uh, you know, awkward socially, and then she meets Rocky. And there they are together, Sly Stallone. I call him Sly because it makes it sound like I know him. <laughs> and uh, Burt Young. And that's on the set of Rocky. Uh, Burt Young, by the way, an adopted name as an actor, was born in 1940 in Queens. He was given uh, the name Burt Young, but he was actually Gerald Tomaso de Louise. As we said, he began boxing when he was in the Marine Corps. He trained under Customato, who was really, he's one of the legendary managers in boxing. And by the way, Burt Young had a record as a boxer of 17 and one. What? Yeah, he was really good. Uh, he has a brother and a, um, a grandson. His wife, Gloria, died in 1974. Burt Young, rest in peace at 80.
three. There was also another curious passing. I want to make sure that I have it here for you because I, um, I was struck by how young the person was and I looked at the details around it and it was after a battle with long COVID. Do you know? Oh, how, no. I don't know. Yeah, and this is the problem. I had my I've... COVID booster shot yesterday. Oh, cool. Way. And you I haven't had the... any reaction to it? I got the well, my arm's sore, but that's about it. I got the COVID no. booster in this arm and I got the flu shot in this arm. Yeah. So Look I got at you. a one-two punch. You have really uh, no need to show off, Kim. I mean, Kim, how are you? Yeah. And I right. swear to you, I walked in there, and I the guy that walked in to give me the shot looked like he was 16 years old. Wow. And I thought, should I say something? Because Don't screw are this you up. old enough to be? Yeah. And he. So your he mom asked... drove you here to your job. <laughs> When he asked for my birthday, I thought I said made a quip What's about your birthday, pal? me right. being old, and I thought, and then I said, I, and I thought, you know what? You have to advocate for yourself sometimes. So I said, well, you, you, I guess I'm really old, but you look really young, and he, you could just kind of tell his shoulder slumped, like not again. Someone's oh, going to yeah. say this to me Everybody. again, and I, and I said, and he goes, "Yep, I have a, I have a the the little boy face or a boyish face," and mm. he said, "But I've been a pharmacist for three years," and then wow, I felt bad. He's the pharmacist. He's a pharmacist. He's been, but I swear to God, he looked like maybe you should have gotten a 16, picture. Oh, Kim. he was young, like he looked really young, like you, you should know, have got a picture, Kim. He just sprouted his first underarm hair, kind of young. All right, Kim, yeah. we don't need to hear that. Uh, <laughs> please. Andy Bean um, is the guy I was talking about. Andy Bean is 70, or was 70. He was a golfer, and he had 11 tournament wins on the PGA Tour. Well, he's passed away, and he just passed away this past weekend. I wanted to mention to you, we just got busy with Israel and Jim Jordan and all this stuff going on. But the reason I mention it is, you know, I'm a big believer in the danger and the underreported nature of long COVID. Mm -hmm. I, I felt this from the very beginning. I read a piece, I think it was in the New Yorker or something, one of some long piece about long COVID. And it was early on, it was like in the first six months of the of the pandemic. And I thought, well, this is a this is a big deal. Now this isn't people who have had reactions to the vaccine or anything. These are people who, you know, you understand long COVID, you know, it hits you and then you never really shake the effects of COVID. You find it in COVID brain that's talked about, inflammation in different parts of the body. This is why even as we talk about reaction to the vaccine, oftentimes left out of that conversation is reaction to COVID. If you get COVID, there can be a reaction. So anyway, this Andy Bean, 70 years old, you just saw Tony put up a picture of him a second ago. He died over the weekend. And the cause was complications of double lung replacement surgery. And apparently he developed issues with his respiratory system after a bout with COVID-19. Mm. Six foot four and about 210 pounds. So he's not overweight. Bean was an imposing presence on the tour in 1978. Dave Anderson, the columnist of the New York Times, called him one of golf's most appealing players. Really sad to, uh, you know, it's funny. As you get older, 70 doesn't seem old enough to be to be dying, to be buying it. But uh, there he is, and he passes away. And I guess, yeah, COVID destroyed his lungs to the point that he needed that double lung transplant. That's and there really were complications, sad. and he uh, he passed away. So uh, it's, a, it's a sad story. And this, which I don't know if you saw... The Mark Thompson Show. There is a journalist who has been detained in Russia. She had to go there for a family emergency. Alsu Kormasheva. She's detained in Russia. The second case of a journalist being detained in Russia. She has um, dual yeah, Russian uh, America rep reporting chops. She reports for both. She reports with Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. She was dis uh, detained in the southwest Russian city of Kazan. This just happened yesterday. 
Um, she's based in Prague and has been charged with failure to register as a foreign agent. By the way, that is the move that the Russian mm -hmm. government makes against journalists. She's one of us. She's radio. A designation uh, Russia requires of any organizations or individuals that it perceives as receiving foreign funding. It's been used to target journalists. They say it here. The charge carries a maximum sentence of five years in prison. Now, RFE slash RL, you know, that's Radio Free Europe, RFE, is a U.S. government-funded media company. You'll remember that the Wall Street Journal reporter was arrested on espionage charges in March. That's Evan Gershkovich, right? Right. He's still being Fa held, yeah. Faces up to 20 years in prison. Now, that's espionage. She's been working with uh, Radio Free Europe for uh, quite some time. And she was temporarily detained while waiting for a return flight on June 2nd at Kazan Airport. So she's leaving Russia, right? She had her U.S. and Russian passports confiscated and has not been able to leave Russia since. She was waiting for her passports to be returned when the new charge was announced. The Russian news outlet Tatar Inform said Russian authorities accused her of conducting a targeted collection of military information about Russian activities. No immediate reaction from the White House. And Russia is mum on the whole thing. And she's got, she's dual citizen. She's Russian and American citizen, right? That's so right. So here they've technically arrested one of their own. The committee, to, well, arresting one of their own is nothing special. I mean, they, no. they target, you know, their own. They, they've killed yeah. Russian dissidents over much less, right? So the committee any, to, you any know. tie to America, anything at all, and you're highly at risk of being thrown in and locked away. Uh, you're of value if they're ties to America. And just in terms of Russia itself and targeting journalists and dissidents, they target journalists and dissidents who are Russian, who have no relation to America. Mm -hmm. They're... Any activist, uh, you know, it's the gulag culture that continues under Vladimir Putin. So David Katz, the renowned analyst on the law, he will join us next. And when he does, we'll talk about everything going on legally and the latest news out of the Sidney Powell plea agreement that she made just this morning. And I want to see how that might impact other cases against Giuliani, against Trump, etc., also, in the next hour, I want to recognize so many of you who've jumped on the Patreon bandwagon. You've stepped up your Patreon pledges month to month. That's really cool. I appreciate it so much. You know, we're a crowdfunded show, so everything you do uh, in that way, PayPal and Patreon helps us, and you can find those hot links at themarkthompsonshow.com. You just click through either one, and uh, so appreciate it. I just today, uh, I click through to a site that I get information from. I, I like you. So I clicked through and supported them just today. Mm -hmm. So uh, I always think, you know, when it comes to independent journalism, opinion, shows you like to check off on all the time, it's good to throw them a little something if you possibly can. So um, I uh, come from regular stock. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're Clarence Thomas, then, you know, you don't have any uh, money to, to throw around, but everybody else, maybe a, a little something. Smash the Smash like button. With your eyes. Rod. Kim's News and then the uh, brilliant David Katz next. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister. Israeli Defense Forces confirming 203 hostages remain captured by Hamas. The total death toll at 5,100. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying... Today, the war between Israel and Hamas will not be a brief one. President Biden scheduled to speak to the American people from the Oval Office, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. He's expected to explain why these conflicts in both Israel and Ukraine are vital to U.S. national security. So that's tonight? That's tonight, 8 p.m. So that's what? So eight, that five? means that President Biden yeah. mm -hmm. will go right up against the football game, which is uh, what? the only mm -hmm. thing more American than listening to the president is uh, watching football, right? What? <laughs> that's, 
That's the Thursday night game. Uh, week seven of the NFL, Jacksonville Jaguars versus uh, New Orleans, right? Saints. Yeah, it's not necessarily the best. Uh, There's a reason yeah. that game. this place is fun. Well, it's not the best matchup maybe, but usually those football games do big audience. So in any case, it's great that he's going on tonight, but I'm just saying that I think a lot of, uh, a lot of Patriots, if you will, a lot of Americans, a lot of, uh, well, there'll just be a big audience for that football game, I imagine. <laughs> you know that you would watch football instead of the president speaking from that's the what i'm office. saying uh, yeah i know you'll probably uh, feel like it's unpatriotic but I'll, I'll tell you the great news of the uh new technological era is that you can watch the president's remarks uh afterward Later. or yeah. or if you prefer you can watch the football game just put it on pause and you can watch the football game after hmm. miss some of the commercials uh okay well the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell is hinting that slower a slower labor market and economic growth are what is needed to bring down inflation. Speaking at the Economic Club of New York, Powell said, just the slowing of prices is not enough here. The Fed wants to bring inflation down to 2%. There is a, a gun safe. It's called Fortress Safe. They are major fail. They are recalling more than 60,000 gun safes after the shooting death of a 12-year-old boy. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission said in a statement, the biometric lock on the safes can be opened by unauthorized users, posing a serious injury hazard and risk of death. It says users may think that they set the lock function, but instead it defaults to open mode. The agency cites a lawsuit that says the boy died from a firearm that was retrieved from one of these safes. It also pointed to 39 incidents of users saying their safes were accessed by fingerprints not paired with it. Not oh supposed to happen. God. Yeah. So you think the you're whole doing the right idea thing. of the biometric yeah. entrance is that it can't mm -hmm. be duplicated. Oh, my God. That's just fortress so safe. Yeah. 60,000 gun safes. They're being recalled. Oh. Yeah. Ford Motor Company says another 150 workers have been temporarily laid off as the United Auto Workers strike reaches day 35. Little progress is being reported between the UAW and the big three automakers, the strike reducing the inventory of some of the most popular vehicle models. And speaking of sports, a new study claims to have figured out which NBA teams have the most vulgar fans. Betaway, or Betway, looked at Reddit and monitored the online chatter amongst the fan bases. After counting up the number of vulgar words used in each team's subreddit over the last four seasons, boy, they really put a lot of time and effort into this one, the club with the most profane fans is the Phoenix Suns, with a total of 577 profanities. Wow. The Toronto Raptors and the Philadelphia 76ers fans are a close second and third, with 524 and 501 words, re uh, respectively. And the team with fans least likely to use colorful language is the Charlotte Hornets, with Aww. only 82 vulgarities. They didn't tell you where the, where the Warriors came They just came counted in. vulgarities, you're saying? Yeah, just the bad words, the, wow. the you know, the nasties. No death threats. No, like you suck. No, just the, oh, yeah. <laughs> just the bad. Well, you words. suck is as strong. It's tried and true. Right. I mean, I yeah. think so too. But yeah. that that didn't count. But they didn't. So but you... unless it's profane, it, it's not considered. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, Zion that's or right. a sucker. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> they it's not. Lastly, we'll end with most American workers are back in the office. U.S. work-from-home rates have dropped to the lowest since the pandemic. According to the latest census data, fewer than 26% of households still have someone working remotely at least one uh, day a week. That's a decrease, big one, from the early 2021 peak of 37%. Data also shows only seven states and Washington, D.C. have a remote work rate above 33%. All 50 states have seen work from home rates fall from their pandemic highs. People are being ushered back into the office. So <sighs> not me. I'm still at home. Thank you, Mark Thompson. <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, especially in the news world where you hear these various news people, uh, top of the hour, ABC mm -hmm. News or whatever yeah. it might be, they're doing it from their house. I mean, they're not they're not in New York at some central ABC office. They're just not. No, I think they mostly are. How dare no. you disagree with me? <laughs>
my friend Sherry Preston has to drive in. She got to New York, to New York t- City. Yeah, she had to pop. She popped a tire in a the whatever tunnel, the major tunnel. She well, Sherry Preston do. has to move in, but but most of yeah. the others do not. No, Alex I um, Stone. There, you know. You think that they are Tony? I'm going to turn it to you because you work with all, all these different radio stations. Are people having to actually Thanks, Tony. go in? I think management <laughs> prefers it. <laughs> oh, so they are making them uh, go in? God. Yeah, they're going in. Uh, this Not is on like the a Mark Thompson coup show. of some kind. Woo-hoo! I'll disagree with me. We're at home. Yeah. Uh, this report is sponsored by something else you want to do at home. Yeah. You know, they do this Have to a... me all the time. I don't know what the hell they yeah. do it for. I say one thing, and Kim gives me evidence that it's not true. All right. Nice big old cup of Coachella Valley coffee, oh, my friend. Yeah, baby. Oh, I mean, a big, steaming, beautiful mug of rich smelling, wonderful mm. coffee. I just got a new, um, I'm trying a new bean from Coachella Valley coffee. Look at this oh. thing if you can see it. What is that? It's the El Salvador oh, bean. Okay. Uh, now, again, you have to go on the site yeah. and you have to find the thing that's best for you. I'm not recommending, I haven't even tried it yet, mm-hmm. but I'm sure all their stuff's great. But this find is a your medium. Bean. This is a, a medium, but you can see light, medium, dark, and there's some tasting yeah. notes on there. You see it? Um, so this is medium, and I usually go for dark, but I'm excited to try this, particularly as a French press or pour over. Yeah. So it's called El Salvador. And again, you know, small batch artisanal coffee roasting is what Coachella's all about. So that's hand-roasted coffee. Yeah. All the beans in this bag, hand-roasted, and everything you get from them has that quality. It's, it's hand-roasted, and it's a great... Well, and as Kim often tells tell you, there you, you get tasting notes on all of the different coffees yeah. and their teas and other things at Coachella Valley Coffee. Now, the key really good is tea. so good. You get ten percent off if you're a listener or viewer of the show. Just use Mark T at checkout and you'll get ten percent off whatever you get. I usually get once I decide on a bean, I'll get a two pound or five pound bag because it's a little less uh, less expensive. It's just I think a greater value. But uh Again, this is fresh grow. You're getting fresh crops. So all the beans, that's why these beans are are so special. And uh, anyway, CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. At checkout, again, don't forget Mark T to get 10% off. I love that we have advertisers that are businesses we really, truly believe in and love. No, it's so Between true. In fact, Tenuta uh, and Coachella, I, I tried to get a, I have this shampoo that I love that's local, and I, I sent them a message to see if they wanted to be a sponsor, and they, did, they didn't ever respond back to me. I have to call them again. But it's with these things where, you know, it's so easy to tell you about something when you believe in it, use it yourself, and love it. And that's the case with uh, the Why Are You Yelling Red and the Coachella Valley Coffee and Tea. Yeah, we. I, I've, been, I've been drinking the Coachella Valley Coffee for Years. I'm just so delighted that they're on the show. It's pretty incredible. Well, I'm Kim McAllister, and this is The Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. This is Mark Thompson. Feels great. When they raided Mar-a-Lago... God didn't like that. We are back, and it's hour two. Coming along this hour will be David Katz. In fact, um, he should be coming any moment now. I just always sent un- him another email. Yeah, I'm always n- unclear yeah. as to exactly when he's coming. But uh, if he doesn't, guy, you know? I'll, get, I mean... I'll dive in without him, but I would love to get his takes on some of what's going on. I want to give a uh, a big shout out to Patricia T. Big shout out. Yeah. She's a new Patreon subscriber. Thanks, Patricia. Hi, Mark, Kim, Tony, John, and gang. Happy one year anniversary. If you're new, we just celebrated our one year anniversary. Love that I can listen to you at any time of the day or night, not only at one specific time, as on the radio. Hoping for many more years. Patricia, thank you very much, Patricia. Yeah. Thank you, everybody who's. Um, I think Mike in Oklahoma also jumped on. I think he's upped his uh, his donations, monthly Thank donations. You, mm-hmm. Dave is another one. Dave, uh, I always don't want to use people's uh, last name because I don't yeah. want them to be doxxed. Dave S. Uh, jumped on as well. Really means a lot. So a uh, thank you. And other correspondences I'll get to along the way. I do have 
a question related to the culture. And um, I'm curious as to what you would think. Now, this is guessable, but don't go nuts. In the chat, you can guess this. The average face value ticket for a Taylor Swift show, mm. what do you think the average face price ticket, not what you'd pay from a ticket broker, but if you could get it at face value, what would the Taylor Swift ticket cost? We'll answer that question while we wait on David Katz. What would be the price of a Taylor Swift show ticket? Mm -hmm. 500 says Julie. 1,000 says Adam. 250 says Pauline. Spencer says 1,500. The average price? Wow. 200 says Edward. 100 to let. $75, says Vilma. The actual retail price, if you could get it off of the face value for a Taylor Swift show. Again, not going through a broker. $254. Mm, yeah, there's some yeah. close guesses in there. And um, the Eagles come in at $239 as an average price. And Springsteen tickets come in this is just most re recently now that's why they're they're all out on tour just below 226 dollars fish tickets average 206 funflation yeah if you wanted a taylor swift ticket and you wanted to get it from a ticket broker what is the average price of a mm. taylor swift ticket this time you're not getting it at face value. This time, you're going through a broker. What is that ticket on average? 800 Two. says Becky. Two grand. Two grand says Kim. Mm -hmm. A thousand says Edward Lee. The actual retail price. If you went through on average, there's 500 says Amy B. 750 says Julie. 2,500 says Tom. 543 dollars <laughs> and 21 cents says John. Uh, the actual huge in Japan says 1,800. The average price for Swift tickets sold in the U.S. on the ticket marketplace like StubHub, 1,095 dollars. Everyone, wow. yeah. The best seats go for thousands. Beyonce and Harry Styles tickets averaged. 380 and 400 respectively crazy yeah crazy there's just a look at that while we're waiting for uh, david katz is david around now yep he's here all right let's do it the mark thompson show he is the former federal prosecutor now he works the defense side of the table you've heard him on london radio they use him all the time if you're driving around london mm -hmm. you can hear david offering legal analysis on what's going on in cases here in the u.s also you've seen him on fox news channel and, and elsewhere he's just a brilliant legal mind and so kind to spend thursdays with us for a little while david katz everybody hi great to be with you great to see you david and just this morning Sidney powell issued a, a plea agreement or they she made a, a plea you can tell me what the official <laughs> the official wording would be uh she pleaded guilty and i'm wondering if you could uh, tell us what she's pleaded guilty to because i think there are also some other charges she hasn't yet pleaded guilty to and then what kind of deal she made and whether or not just to, uh, i was saying it doesn't seem like a very um like she got a good deal from what i can see w what is your thought well, she certainly got what people would call a slap on the wrist, um, or in the uh, words of the Republican House, um, <clears throat> before chaos descended, uh, a sweetheart deal. But this was sweet, sweeter than any sweetheart deal, because I told people that I thought that the prosecutor down there in Atlanta, Georgia, in that state case, was being you know, overly aggressive and almost threatening when she announced right after the charges that people could get five years in prison. And she emphasized that it was a mandatory minimum case, which was to say that people had to get five years in prison. 
And now, you know, she agreed, Sidney Powell did, to cooperate with that prosecutor down there in Atlanta, Georgia. And all of a sudden, it's not a felony, Mark. It's, it's no, that's exactly right. Six misdemeanor charges and 12 and months of have, probation for each count. She doesn't have to go to that terrible prison down there that, uh, you know, uh, everybody was uh, complaining about and saying, oh, my God, those people, those people, they're going to face time in that prison down there. Well, she's not going to serve five minutes in that prison down there. And of course, this is the classic case where the prosecutor says you should believe Sidney Powell. I don't think she knows very much about Trump, so I don't even think they're getting much you know, um, benefit out of making that plea agreement with her, but they're getting rid of her as a defendant in the case. That's one less person to try. And the irony is that she's one of the people who asked for a speedy trial, Mark. So, um, and, and that kind of messed up the strategy of Chesbro or Cheeseboro, who is going to trial. In fact, his jury selection starts tomorrow. That's the um, other attorney, her co-defendant. He asked for a speedy trial. He had one, apparently he's not gonna take a plea deal. He's a, you know, uh, before this case, certainly a reputable, well-respected attorney um, whose career will obviously be destroyed by a conviction in this case. I don't think Sidney Powell really had much of a future legal career that was worth very much. Uh, but this fellow who went to Harvard Law School worked on the Gore um, dispute with Bush uh, back in the day. Um, I think he's very worried about his legal reputation. He's going to go to trial. So I guess my thoughts on Sidney Powell was that uh, it's actually probably uh, net good for Cheeseboro not to have to go to trial with her. That can focus just on the Cheeseboro charges. They're again going to try to prove this whole racketeering conspiracy, which I think of as this sort of monster. They're going to show all of these things that happened in all these places by all these people for months. And then they're finally going to get to Cheeseboro and say, hey, you were part of all of this because you worked on the slates. And of course, it's going to leave a very bad taste in the uh, mouth of the jurors. And I think be prejudicial to him that they're allowed to put on this whole racketeering case. But their argument is it's not the usual balancing between prejudicial and probative that having charged this racketeering conspiracy, the prosecution has a right to put it all on against any defendant who they claim is a part of that racketeering organization and then prove the very small part that uh, admittedly that person played, admittedly by the prosecution, but they say they're entitled to put it all on as irrelevant and as prejudicial as that whole mass of evidence is against the person. But I think that the jury is usually pretty clear eyed and they'll see that, you know what, this all affected other people. Let's look at what he did. And Mark, what he supposedly did was he said that these were qualified slates of electors and he should have known well enough to know with his legal experience and the language that he used that they were only qualified by Republican operatives. They were only qualified by the party that wanted the Republicans to win. They weren't qualified by law. They weren't qualified by any legislature or any judicial order. And that to palm them off as being really qualified slates uh, who could go to Washington and who could be heard, who could be allowed to vote, who could have an effect on Vice President um, Pence, he knew enough. But they have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt and I'm sure he'll put on an able defense. It'll be on television, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. I hope it's on a TV station that I can get uh, during the day or at night after work. It'll be streamed. I'm sure it'll be available. The, um, uh, you know, the the whole thing with the fake electors and then uh, the tampering with voting machines. I mean, there's a lot here, David. This is a really, this is a really nasty thing. These people were trying to get away with. Mark, and, no uh, doubt about it, but I don't think he's charged with tampering with the machines. I think that was just uh, Powell. And so that's uh, right. that may still be part of the overall Sorry. racketeering conspiracy. His lawyers will say he had nothing to do with that, just like they'll say he had nothing to do with other stuff that you've had to listen to for weeks, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. He had nothing to do with that whatsoever. Uh, I see. That's, right. Uh, right. That's still uh, a telling point with the jury. But that was all very nice. There are a lot of problems in America. A lot of people at Cheeseboro didn't even know, did a lot of things. But you know what? Let's focus on the man in the courtroom. Oh, that's it. Yeah, I can tell you, you're a good defense attorney. Uh, so uh, if Powell is, boy, hip deep in some, so much of that that I've just talked about, the fake electors and the, uh, you know, talking about the voting machines, and I was talking about the bogus theories that she was serving up with Venezuela and all this other stuff. She, she said a lot of things to sort of muddy the water about the election, uh, to be kind about it. Uh, and she's only getting a slap on the wrist is there anything you can you can look at to sort of suggest from that that others who are involved in this may not be treated so harshly? 
Well, that's the system that we have. Um, it's not so much in the federal courts. What normally would have happened to her in the federal courts, let's assume she was charged with four counts and on um, all of them, she could have gotten five years in prison. The feds probably would have picked one count that you could only get three years in prison for. So her lawyers would know the worst that could happen to her is three years on one count. And then the plea agreement would have been that the government will bring to the court's attention how much she cooperated, whether it was valuable, whether they thought it was truthful. But the ultimate decision, whether she got straight probation or up to three years in prison, would be up to the federal judge. And then you could argue in front of the jury when the defense attorney, like I am now, will inevitably say if they're any good, this person would have said that juror number three was part of the conspiracy in order to get straight probation and not have a felony, not serve one day in jail. They would have ratted on you. They would have made up stuff on the other person. How can you believe a word they say? Then the prosecutor can come back and say, you understand that the person who's going to decide your sentence is not me but the federal judge sitting up here. And then everybody looks at the federal judge on high in the courtroom and the jurors think, you know what? It is gonna be up to the judge. And that becomes a legitimate argument to make because of the way the plea agreement is usually written in federal court. Uh, but this one, as long as the prosecutor says that the prosecutor believes that Sidney Powell was telling the truth, um, that the deal holds and that she will get probation and not serve a day and only have a misdemeanor. And so expect uh, that'll be, again, I don't think she's gonna testify against um, uh, Cheeseboro, but if, if there's a case that she would testify, and of course people are looking ahead to the Trump case, uh, she'll be able to testify about meetings she had with Trump. Remember the stormy meeting where mm -hmm. he's trying to put her in as a special counsel, special prosecutor uh, to go after all the people who stole the election. Um, uh, well, she could tell about that. And, and if Trump whispered in her ear and said, you know, I know this isn't kosher, but, you know, the Democrats would have done this to us. Let's do it to them. And then Trump will say he never said that. And if she can corroborate something like that, she's a great witness. And if she can't, they're going to say she's a stone cold liar who'd say anything in the world to try to not go to that awful prison down in Atlanta. Well, that lays it out. You mentioned Trump. Uh, you know, David Katz, Trump's strategy appears to be just to kind of slow the process. I wonder if you could speak to how that's done legally without, you know, try to, with, and getting away with it for, you know, without running afoul of the court. He was also given a warning by the judge yesterday. I guess he was speaking sort of loudly. And uh, the judge said, hey, dude, she, she didn't say dude, but she said, uh, and she kind of warned everybody in the court, keep your voices down. Well, yes, that's a uh, plain vanilla. Um, I think that was the judge in, uh, the male judge in, uh, the uh, New York City case. Oh, okay. It was, a, it was a guy. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's just something you can't do. And, you know, you can't sort of stage whisper. You know, I've had clients try to do that. Um, and of course, people have that reaction, whether it's genuine or not, when someone says, that was the man, you know, uh, you know, what defendant isn't going to say, or not me, you know, and then start, you know, <laughs> gesturing in their hands or talking to their lawyer. And if it's loud, and first of all, the, the grimacing, the gestures, the judge, uh, may very well put an end to that and say, you know, stop with the pantomime, stop with the acting out, you know, sit there. Um, but, you know, you see a lot of that, of course, it's a kind of human nature. Uh, and then with the people commenting, if you comment loud enough, you know, if it's really a stage whisper, a judge is going to say, hey, keep it down. You know, you'll have a chance to, to testify, but it's not now. But I think what's interesting is the gag order. Um, I actually had the privilege of having a uh, dinner with a couple of other people with um, Dean Chemerinsky last night. He's the dean sure. of my law school at uh, UC Berkeley Law. Uh, he also wrote an editorial in yesterday's Los Angeles Times, um, pointing out basically that while he wishes uh, that Trump would shut up a lot more than he does, uh, to order him to shut up, uh, to issue a gag order, he thinks that the court in Washington, D.C., the federal judge there, that she went too far. And um, there's a famous case um, regarding a Democratic congressman. Um, his name was Ford, and he was in Tennessee. And when he was running for reelection, um, he was also being charged with corruption, and there was a gag order placed against him. It went up to the Court of Appeals, and the gag order was thrown out. It was the main uh, case that the lawyers for Trump argued why this judge should not impose a gag order. And they quoted Thomas Jefferson. They talked about the fact that the judicial branch shouldn't get involved in 
telling, in that case, another um, a member of another branch of government, the legislative branch, what he couldn't couldn't say, even in regard to the trial that was pending against him. Um, now, of course, Trump is not, while he was in the executive branch, he's not a current office holder. But you can see where it certainly applies to someone who's running for uh, the presidency and seems to be the, the leader uh, for the Republican nomination at the moment. Uh, one of the things about her order that was troubling to Dean Chemerinsky and is troubling to me was the language is a little imprecise. Um, it says that Trump is not supposed to target members of the prosecution team and the court staff. So let me give you a few examples. Um, now, you can't lie. You can't defame somebody. Uh, you know, if you defame somebody in the government, they can sue you like anybody else. But, you know, one of the great things about this country is that you can have very vocal, you can have vitriolic criticism of the government. That's something you don't have in a lot of other countries. Um, but you can have it here. And uh, Trump is vitriolic. But the question is, is this beyond the First Amendment? Um, and uh, you, know, you take some of the examples. He says that the prosecutor against him is deranged. You and I can sit here and say the prosecutor is deranged. We can say that some federal judges around the country are in the bag. Uh, we can call cannon loose cannon. Uh, why couldn't we do that if we were on trial? Uh, why can't Trump do that while he's on trial? He says that the judge, who I think is highly respected, and I think that she's very competent, but he says the judge who has his case is, what does he call her, uh, uh, Obama hack, um, an Obama hack. Well, I mean, you can go around and you can say that there's a lot of judges who are hacks. I'm about to tell you that the judge who just issued the, the ghost gun decision down there seems to me like a total hack and totally in the bag for um, the, the, uh, the, the gun industry. Now, if I were down there in his courtroom and I was a defendant, why couldn't I say that about him? Why couldn't I say the exact same thing about him? And worse, it wouldn't be very much in my self-interest. Now, as the lawyer, if I was the lawyer for the person in his courtroom as a criminal defendant, there are well-established rules that a lawyer can be prevented because we're officers of the court um, and so forth. We can be sanctioned. We can be punished. So we can't exercise our full panoply of First Amendment rights. Um, let me give you one more example. The court staff. Let's assume that it was, um, you know, it's four years from now. It's Newsom running for office. Newsom's ahead in the polls. He's running against DeSantis. He's running against uh, the third it, third time Trump seeking office. So now it's Newsom. Um, and Newsom gets charged with something. It's going to be in Texas in federal court. It's going to be in Idaho in federal court. And right during the election campaign, just this point, about a year before the election, Newsom is charged. And Newsom finds out that all of the law clerks for the judge who's prosecuting him did terribly in law school, uh, and they're all members of the Federalist Society. Can he not say that? Can he not comment on court staff to say those things? Now, if they weren't at the bottom of their class, he's defamed them, right? And if he's gotten their transcripts by uh, some kind of hacking or improper thing, he's broken the law. It's not that he's broken the gag order. It's that he's broken whatever law he did, or he's, he's defamed them. And the other thing that I think is that she has to be worried, and this is Dean Chemerinsky's uh, comment too, about the remedy. Is she really going to put him in jail if he violates her order? To make an order that doesn't have any teeth is sort of worse than nothing. Um, so the next time that they come to court and they say that he violated it, uh, what's she going to do? Now, I think what she's going to do if it's bad enough is fine him. I think it would be playing into his hands, and I think she'd realize that if she locks him up even for a day or for an hour. So she could fine him. And of course, he'll portray that as just, you know, more of the deep state going after him, uh, another Democratic African-American judge who doesn't like him, whose friends don't like him, uh, trying to stop him from winning the presidency. So I think that it's fraught. He's appealed it already. Um, and uh, he has a right to appeal it. Uh, it's in what's called an interlocutory appeal, but he's entitled to not wait until the end of the case. And so we'll be seeing soon. Um, I think I'm Am I over? Am I sixteen for sixteen? So I'm I'm throwing my. <laughs> You're pretty strong. I gotta say. I, I, I may be going sixteen one, but I think that the order will not be thrown out completely. But I think it will be greatly modified and watered down by uh, you, appellate court. If you're just joining us, David Katz. One of his superpowers is not only legal analysis, but it is these insanely accurate predictions as to. What's going to happen in various judgments and uh, trials? There's never been anything like this. Yeah, there really has it. David really brings the brings the heat. So this is his latest one. He thinks that the gag order will be modified. Um, I, you know, you mentioned the ghost gun thing 
but, but uh, before I get into ghost guns, is there anything else about Trump that uh, I, I was talking about the slowing down of the uh, of the whole process? The, the idea just sort of just kill the clock is what Trump is trying to do in all these different cases. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that being the strategy? Well, let's take the easiest one, the one in New York, the criminal case in New York about paying hush money to the porn star where Michael Cohn and Stormy Daniels will be key witnesses in that case. That's supposed to go sometime in the late spring. I just don't think it fits. I don't think there's time for it. I think it'll get continued just on the basis of it doesn't fit with all the federal cases and other cases that are. So that will automatically be pushed. uh, So he doesn't need to worry about even delaying that. Okay. I don't think so. I think the civil cases, uh, they'll go forward. He doesn't need to be there for the civil cases. And so like the E. Jean Carroll, you know, uh, Redux, um, this case that he's in right now, this case will go to its conclusion uh, about his overvaluing his assets for uh, getting loans and his undervaluing them to pay taxes on them. That case will go forward to completion. The case down in the Southern District of Florida in front of the one that we lovingly call Loose Cannon. And that's the uh, document that case, yeah. Yeah, I think she's made clear that the Mar-a-Lago documents case, um, she's been yelling at the special prosecutor. She's been finding fault with all sorts of things. Uh, she'll punt that case for them uh, past November 2024. The Atlanta case, I don't think with the amount of, I mean, if someone's going to go to trial now for three or four months, then there'll be another ground. Then, you know, uh, so I don't think they're ever going to get Trump to trial by November 2024, which leaves him with the case in D.C., which I think really is on track. I think that judge will do everything uh, on the idea that it is in the public interest for someone who's running for president, for the public to know whether the jury thinks he's guilty or not guilty. I think that same argument applies to Senator Menendez before he runs for reelection. The public has a right to know. And she will basically say that that interest, that public interest in us knowing and it's being decided is more important than the private interest that Trump might like to have more time. And that when Trump argues, my lawyers just couldn't do it, you know, they had to appeal you on the gag order. Uh, They also had to do this. They had to do the other thing. She can say you can appeal as much as you want. You can bring as many motions as you want. But that March date is firm. And I mentioned this before. I think that they will show meticulously all they did to try to get ready. And then they'll go to the appellate court and say, look, we had these Herculean efforts. We still couldn't get ready. Um, You know, the Speedy Trial Act is not to make you go to trial. It's not a rush to judgment act. It has exclusions and we're within the exclusions. He needed more time. And then the appellate courts who are conservative, because he'll get to the U.S. Supreme Court, I believe, on that claim. um, I think that the will five to four for him that he did indeed need more time. Wow. So at the end of all of that, it is ultimately the appeal will be able to you can kick that can down the road but you think the jack smith trial on j6 for trump that will proceed on schedule is no is that one I, no i think that one's about 50 50 i think that the judge there um chutkin will do right. everything that she can to make it go forward she'll say to trump look if you need if you if your seven lawyers weren't enough hire 17 lawyers you could afford it Hire one for your appeal, hire one for your motion, hire one to do the other thing, but this trial is going to go. And the only way I think they can disturb that date, you know, pending some disaster that we haven't thought of, but uh, is to go to in January, make a motion for a continuance, say, look at all the work that we've done, all seven lawyers, or however many there are in the case, uh, we've done everything that we can, we still can't get ready, we haven't had time to interview these witnesses, to brief this, to do this jury study that we want to do, and she'll say, no, you could have hired more lawyers, you had plenty of money, uh, you knew when it was going to be. And from that order, in about January of next year, he'll go first to the D.C. Circuit, and then he'll try to go I to see. the U.S. Supreme Court, right. and he'll say, look, my rights are being violated, this is a rush to judgment, here's the 12 things that I needed to do, I didn't have time to do them, and I think the Supreme Court will say five to four. But that one is that one's very, very tough. And that also assumes that Trump is on his way to get the nomination. If he falters, and this is why he wants so badly to get the nomination run for president. If he falters, I think it'll be a totally different calculus. A calculus. Sure, sure. Um, because then then now I you're not dealing with a presidential candidate anymore, of right. course. Yeah. Uh, um, so this is really interesting, David, because I didn't understand, and I guess you've really made it clear how the appellate process itself, it can have so many layers. All of those uh, all of those systems that are associated with that appeal that you just described, not to uh, drill down too far on this, but I'm just curious, 
is the appellate process itself slow? I mean, how many months will all of that take that you just described? They can expedite the decisions. And there was a lot of criticism, of course, during the Trump administration that it seemed like that all of the appeals got slow walked if they helped him. Trying to get his tax return took two years, uh, took two trips to the U.S. Supreme Court, two arguments in the U.S. Supreme Court. And then by the time they finally got his tax returns in the Congress, you remember, um, it was years after they started trying. Um, and so the appellate process can be very fast. Cases can be expedited. Um, and so I think that there would be a decision. I don't think that because it, it has it has to be if there's no decision, the trial goes then. Um, so the appellate courts, there's just two layers. There's the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which would hear the appeal from Judge Chutkin's order that this trial has to go and it's going in March and I'm not moving it. They would go to them. They would get a decision. Let's say they went in January. They get a decision well before March 6th uh, when it's supposed to start. And then let's say they got that decision on February 20th. Um, then there'd be an emergency uh, request to the U.S. Supreme Court to issue a stay. And then if they issued the stay, then they might explain their decision later. But they wouldn't wait that long, the U.S. Supreme Court, because imagine the whole nation expecting that trial to go uh, in early March. And then all of a sudden the Court of Appeals says, yes, that is when it's going. And then there's this uh, appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court wouldn't have to take the case. But if they made a good enough record, um, I can see that five or six justices on the U.S. Supreme Court saying, or maybe they wouldn't delay it uh, all the way till after the election. Maybe they would say, OK, you guys have shown you need three more months. They delay it three more months and then expect that whole thing to repeat itself. And it could go. I mean, it's it's a real that one. I'm not making a prediction. What do they call that? Sports? Well, you think that. But you said if what it goes to Supreme Court, sports? even even just <laughs> yeah. no, you pick. Said, uh, no pick. You, you said uh, if it goes to Supreme Court, you think it's probably a five four decision for Trump, though, you, you were saying. I look at the votes. There's right, uh, of course. Yeah, he's. It's a stock. You know, it's a stock. Uh, I come from regular stock. Yeah, you've got uh, Clarence Thomas and the crew, right? Uh, the, the one, the one he sometimes loses is Chief Justice John Roberts. But you know, the the people who are really cynical and think that Barrett, um, you know, uh, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch are the three that he nominated for the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, I know that's a very, very cynical view of things. It's one expressed by Trump. It is so distasteful to how our courts are supposed to work and the rule of law. Um, but again, betting money, like I said, they won't say we did it for Trump. They'll say we did it for the Speedy Trial Act, for American you know, justice, liberty, that people need to have time to go to trial. Um, and this is actually a fast, if you look at it, Mark, this is fairly fast for such a complex case with three different conspiracies. If this were a you or me, God forbid, uh, we would probably have more time than Trump had. We'd probably have uh, uh, over a year. You look at some of these famous cases, they have taken two, three years to get to trial. I'll tell you something else, which is interesting, though. I thought this issue might come up, uh, you know, in many different forms. And so I looked it up. It's actually surprising how fast some of the big cases went to trial. The Watergate cases actually went to trial pretty fast. And some of the cases with senators and Congress members. But one of the reasons was that they wanted the jury to say not guilty or to hang before their election. So they themselves were OK with a fairly speedy trial. But Trump will do everything on God's green earth to delay that trial. Well, the last thing I'll say, and then I want to hear from Kim, but the last thing I'll say is that he has raised money off of this like nobody's business. If you look at what the money raised constitutes to this point, these are scary numbers. Donald Trump loves being this embattled victim-like figure for fundraising purposes. So uh, he's playing that uh, uh, as a as a sideshow as well. Go ahead, Kim. Can, can I say one last thing, Kim, before yeah, your comment? Just one last thing. Yes, I, I, won't different, I won't, I won't remember topic, the joke. So. I won't yeah. remember the joke. I'm sorry. Yeah. But if I were representing Trump, which I never would, and somehow I tried that January 6th case and the jury said not guilty, I guarantee you Trump would whisper in my ear, What's wrong with these people? How stupid are they? <laughs> <laughs> he knows that his heart and mind, and, and then he said, not that deep, right on the surface, plus deep inside, he knows that his heart and mind, he is so guilty of January 6th that it's not even funny. Go ahead. Can we start a GoFundMe for a for good bribes? I mean, vacations for the Supreme Court judges, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, that's from fire Russ. Go fire. ahead. Yeah, go, Kim. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the Joran Vandersloot thing from yesterday. And 
basically he was being charged with fraud and something else for allegedly trying to extort money from Natalie Holloway's family for information about where the body was dumped or what happened to her. It turns out that he he enters a, some type of agreement, settlement agreement with them or plea ar- arrangement where he is pleads guilty to the the fraud charges but in doing so has to say and admit yes I killed her and here's where I dumped her and here's how I did it does that mean he's never going to be held accountable for the actual murder because the information of getting to the what happened to her where is she is more important than the holding you accountable for it I haven't followed the case that closely, but I know that the family was, of course, extremely distraught. Uh, I mean, that doesn't begin to capture it. Then they really wanted to know what happened to their their daughter, this person right. that they loved. So they were okay, I believe, with this disposition. And if a victim's family says, we're okay with this disposition as a prosecutor, it's like, are we really going to push it further? Are we going to push this case to a trial down mm-hmm. the road because the defendant won't agree to such and such? But the family's okay with it. The defendant's okay with it. We're not okay with it. So we're going to force everyone through a traumatic trial. So I think that was part of the calculation. And again, I don't know the case. All I mean, I know it happened outside the United States. I think he was not a U.S. citizen. It may be that killing a U.S. citizen anywhere gives you federal jurisdiction uh, over the murder. But it's certainly a, a legal issue that would have come up. And again, I think if the family was okay with that disposition, he is serving something over 20 years in Peru for the murder of of someone else, which of course assumes that he murdered her, but he admits Mm -hmm. that he murdered her. Um, He was demanding sex. She didn't want to have sex with him. He he became furious, freaked out, killed her, dumped her in the ocean. That's his confession. Yep. Yeah. And that's that. No, I I think think that the judge noted the confession time in Peru, in prison in Peru. Um, that's not a good place to be in prison, but it's where people who murder people belong. Um, you've changed the course of our lives, said uh, uh, her mother, the um, Natalie's mother. And um, he is um, he was mentioned, uh, what he did was mentioned um, in the judge's remarks. You have brutally murdered in, in separate instances, years apart, two young women. And, and he goes on. It's a... Um, it's a troubling case, but that was interesting. I wondered about what also uh, were the effects of his um, confession and, and, and mm-hmm. his plea agreement. Uh, now I want to ask you, David, in closing, about the ghost gun uh, decision. On There is a, you know, in this United States of guns, it seems as though any gun, any weapon, however it's fabricated, however it's put together, wherever it comes from, is protected. Can you speak to the ghost gun decision? Yes, it's really uh, fascinating. Um, Imagine that you had a wheelchair, and instead of uh, selling the wheelchair as a wheelchair, you sold the wheel separate from the chair, and all you had to do was screw them together, okay? So the the, the ghost gun's really not a great expression. They're just guns that have different parts, two or three different parts, that you screw together. And once you screw them together, guess what? You have a perfectly serviceable firearm that that expels a projectile, an explosive, and that can kill people. But... If you put the wheelchair together, if you put the three parts of the gun together, then you have to put a serial number on it and it becomes traceable. So these manufacturers uh, of these uh, ghost guns have this great commercial idea that they're going to sell it um, in three different parts. And then they don't have to put a serial number on it or anything else because it's not a firearm. The government said it is a firearm and you have to put a serial number on it and you have to make it so that it's traceable. You put the serial number on each one of the three parts. So the the gun lobby and especially these two manufacturers of these uh, firearms that just come in three parts to to assemble um, went to their favorite judge. uh, This judge in um, his name is Reed O'Connor. Uh, Believe it or not, he worked on the Senate Judiciary Committee, I guess, for the Republicans, and he was a nice guy. Everybody liked him. So they approved him by a voice vote. I mean, Leahy, Feinstein, Bernie Sanders approved this fellow on a voice vote. And there he sits in the Northern District of Texas, and he's issued one terrible overturned ruling after another. He is the same judge, Mark, who struck down Obamacare and freaked everyone out 
until Obamacare went to the US Supreme Court and they said, of course it's a tax. Forget the Commerce Clause, it's a tax. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts made that famous decision. But until then, he'd issued a nationwide injunction purporting to knock out Obamacare. And he's issued a bunch of other decisions that are far out and that got reversed. So he issued the first decision in this case that, as I said, this was not supposedly a firearm. It went to the Fifth Circuit, which is another subject that we should talk about. We'll bore your, your uh, listeners. But they, they affirm these decisions. They affirmed Obamacare. They affirmed the uh, medical abortion pill case. This is that Fifth Circuit down there in Louisiana. Oh, so this, in, is, a, uh, this is a good Texas. place to be maybe for the uh, appeal of this decision? It's or not? so Trumpian. Well, so they affirmed this judge, and it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court took the nationwide stay off. They said, we are not going to have a nationwide stay. The federal government can treat this as a firearm. They can demand that people put um, the, um, you know, what, what I'm talking about here, the um, uh, serial numbers on the, the, yeah, the, the, put the serial numbers on all three parts. The federal government can do that. The Supreme Court said that five to four, scary. Uh, Kavanaugh didn't think that uh, if you make a wheel in a chair with a screw, that it's a wheelchair. Wow. Um, they didn't think that this wow. was a good so Kavanaugh ruled that you didn't have to put the serial number on the three parts. But luckily, Amy Coney Barrett went with Chief Justice Roberts to have five votes. So they sent it back to the district judge and they say, OK, now do what's sensible with this case. Now that you know that it is a firearm, it has to have a serial number. The two manufacturers that make it said, oh, wait a second. This doesn't apply to us, the nationwide injunction. But we have special reasons why we need to market this. We're going to go bankrupt if we're not allowed to market this. you got to put the stay back on. And this judge in this northern district of Texas judge said, oh, my goodness, you would be harmed. You'd be going bankrupt. Oh, my goodness. You, too, you know, all didn't mean all. All apparently meant all, but you, too. And he said that here's the injunction for the two, which meant you could still buy it without a serial number from the two people who actually manufactured it. It totally undercut the injunction that the, the, the taking the injunction off by the U.S. Supreme Court. That was not enough for the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit said beautifully argued, yes, all but two, all does not mean all but those two. The Fifth Circuit said the U.S. Supreme Court, bless their souls, on Monday unanimously said basically that you're defying our order. Uh, you know, you got to go back to reading comprehension 101, uh, district court <laughs> judge down in Texas, and uh, they, they, uh, they overruled him nine zip in a short order. But that's what's so confusing about it. And so the, the reporting on it was terrible, including on Fox, which I think said something like, you know, Supreme Court falls for Biden administration gun argument. They didn't fall for anything. It was nine nothing to do now exactly what they ordered be done last summer. And that's why people have deja vu when they see the decision, because they think, I know, wasn't this decided already? Yes. Yes to the Fifth Circuit. Yes to the district judge. This was decided already. You don't get to countermand the U.S. Supreme Court. So at the end of all of that, as the dust settles, the the requirement will be for serial numbers on those those parts, those distinct parts of the gun. That's the law right now. And thank goodness, because as the administration pointed out, these um, ghost guns, as they're called, these these guns that you just put together. And so they're 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 the ones that are used by terrorists. They're the ones that are used by criminals. They're the ones that are used by people who don't want their use of the gun to be traceable. Uh, anyone who's using it for a legitimate purpose would have no problem with it being traceable. They haven't done anything wrong. So, yes, the quote ghost guns now are traceable. They have serial numbers. And uh, for all I, I know, you don't have any listeners who are terrorists or criminals, but for any who might be might hear this somewhere, um, you will get caught. You will get caught because there'll be a serial number even on the ones that you assemble. Yeah, which is the way it should be. Uh, David, thank you. Love your takes. We covered a lot of territory today, and I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, you can find David across the uh, the spectrum. He's uh, he's a working lawyer, defense lawyer. But wow, you are uh, so good to give your time to those British people who always have you on in London and uh, uh, across the, the cable universe. And uh, just a really, really cool that you spend time with us, too. We appreciate it, David. It's our well, one year anniversary, being, and I thank you for that. I love being with you, Mark, and with Kim and uh, Albert. Great, great. Yeah, it's great. Good times. All right. Thanks so much, David Katz, everybody. <laughs> Love it. That's our David. The Mark Thompson Show. That was really cool. So many good takes on so much. And I've been watching the chat as well. Um, 
Now, did Jim Jordan do something? He announced uh, that he's gonna. He wants to take mm, another yeah, shot a, at it. Yeah, there's another vote coming. Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean that's kind of been my point on Jim Jordan. He doesn't. Mm-hmm. He doesn't give up. He's you know he, there's a certain he has no shame, and so there's a certain pride he takes in a being the center of attention. Remember, he's all these cameras around him. They're following him down the hallway. You're going to do it again. This guy loves it. It's great mm-hmm. for his brand. Yeah. And there's a lot of that in Congress now. There's a lot of that in in life in America now, and I would say worldwide. The the way in which media coverage and the degree to which you can increase your profile makes you a more it feeds your bottom line. It makes you a more wanted brand. House Speaker vote live updates. Jordan says there will be a third vote after mm-hmm. all. Yeah, exactly. What? He's backing off that plan for the temporary speaker with McHenry. Yeah. He's saying, nope, I want it. We're going to go for it. Uh, the Mark Thompson show, wrong. Jordan quit. No, mm, that's no, not right, Queen. It. You're wrong, Queen. You, How dare you were you, right queen? earlier, but now you're wrong. Well, it, even earlier, he didn't queen, quit. He, he just hadn't took quit. A break. He took a yeah. pause. Okay. Mm-hmm. He's not quitting. Yeah. The, uh, the whole thing with him is that you know, he's going to stay at it, wear you down, threaten you. He really believes that over time, people will just go, you know what? It's just too much trouble. Just go ahead and make the guy speaker. That really is his plan. So yeah. uh, This is no picnic, no summer camp. That's right. Clearly is not. <laughs> you know, uh, on, uh, on David Katz, my daughter came home the other day with a, an assignment in English, actually, social studies kind of assignment about whether or not you believe in double jeopardy. You think it's a good thing or a bad thing? So we Double Jeopardy is where you can be tried again for the same thing. Like murder, specifically, right? Okay. I think is murder. And so she was saying uh, that it's a bad thing because it allows killers to go free. So then I had to take the opposite point and talk about how c- you could you know, go after someone and harass them. And if you had the case the first time, then bring it. Anyway, mm. I was this close to calling David Katz. I was going to abuse my Mark Thompson show privileges wow. and yeah. call him into the discussion, but I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to bother yeah, him. Yeah, I'm glad that. you didn't. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, it doesn't have to just be murder. Double Jeopardy is just to oh, be it? tried, more than tried one thing? again. Okay. And Double Jeopardy is when they double the uh, money values on the board in Jeopardy. That's <laughs> the, uh, yeah. There you go. So you got both of those. You know, yeah. In case uh, you, could ar- you, you want to argue that, you can argue that. I'll take legal um, questions for Mark uh, for 500, Mark Thompson. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Tony, could I do a mini That's Rich just to leave everybody with a nice little palate cleanser? Would you, can All you right. rally a That's Rich for me, please? Uh, we like to follow the money, uh, some of the deals, where stuff is going. We do it in a segment we call That's Rich. Who are they? The top one-tenth of one percent. What are they like? These people are so posh and snobby, they're snobby. That's Rich on the Mark Thompson Show. Well, you love him and you hate him. But however you think of him, he has a lot of money. I'm talking about the Fox News anchor, Brett Baer. What? Yes, He has just listed his home in Washington, D.C. How much is Brett Baer's home listed for? Brett Baer, the anchor on Fox News Channel. He wants to sell his house. He's moving on to another place. He's changing cribs. How much is Brett Baer's house listed for? Julie says 10 million. Ron says 9 million. Four and a half million says Karen. 8.7 million says Tom. How many bathrooms asks Les Commentaire? I should give you the description, you're right. But just knowing what he knows, knowing the DC market, 17 million says DMAC. John says 12 million. 2.3 says BA. 9.7 says Edward Lee. The actual retail price. What he, Brett Bear, has listed his DC home for. $32 million, everybody. That's right. It would be 
Look at that mansion. It would be a record. That's a nice driveway to pull up to. Mm-hmm. It's a potentially record-setting price. Wow. Just had gone on the market. Fox News' Brett Baer and his oh, wife, Amy. That's an ugly floor. They've listed their French Chateau-style Berkeley home mm. for $31.9 million. Can you park the Bentley in the circular drive? Mm, indeed. Mm -hmm. If it goes for the asking price, it'll be the most expensive residential sale Why would they in paint that room black? history. Mm. Uh, square footage is 16,250. Wow. Um, it sits on 1.47 acres, five bedrooms, and anyone, you want to take a guess at how many bathrooms, Kim? I won't put it, I won't make it a millionaire thing. But... Five bedrooms? Yeah. I'm going to say 11 bathrooms. That was a no, big house. Look at you, 11 bathrooms. Got to mm -hmm. go, got to go. Yeah. How about you, Tony? How do you think, how many bath? maybe you've seen it already, but you know how many bathrooms? No, but I just look at the basketball court in the theater. Well, you got to. Uh, so if you've been playing basketball, you need to go to the bathroom. How many options do you have in the house? That was the question. Right. Twelve. Seven is the answer. Oh, thanks, okay. Tony. Uh, five bedrooms, <laughs> guys. Come on, get your bathroom guesses in order. Two half baths, though. So uh, in a way, you're not. Um, see. Yeah. Thank you. I apologize, Tony. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> um. Other touches include a custom bar in the living room with a floor-to-ceiling wine display, a primary suite with two primary baths and heated floors, mm. a home gym, a cinema, a spa, a two-story indoor sports court, and golf simulator. <laughs> wow. If you get it in order, you get extra points. I don't even want to try to get it in order. The gated property has a paved motor court with a fountain, tiered gardens, a 56-foot-long heated pool, a chipping and putting green, and two three-car yeah. garages. Are That's you right. kidding me? Mm-hmm. That guy knows how to live. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, pretty great. It's fantastic. I uh, damn straight it is. Um. They purchased a $37 million Palm Beach mansion earlier this year. Wow, they got a lot of money, these uh, bears. Their other D.C. property that they uh, had was a 10,000-square-foot home in Phillips Park, part of Washington, $6.5 million in 2021. So they've moved up. Kim's not crazy about the, uh, the, uh, the foyer layout, and no, uh, she doesn't like I that. I'm a little dizzied by all the dots and this. Yeah, it's modern, I Kim, I know. But, Not uh, a fan. Maybe the motor court will take your mind off it. And if that doesn't it do it, maybe a couple of moments in the yeah. cinema. And if that <laughs> yeah. doesn't do it, uh, help me out. maybe some full court basketball. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't do it, you can walk along the acreage that is all yours that closet's pretty nice i don't Good like the luck. spiky live... la the spiky lights but other otherwise wow i could I sell my home my and live in the bear's closet <laughs> yeah. yeah it's true Come it's on. like a one-bedroom apartment in the city it's pretty nice so uh that's the story on your favorite fox news channel anchor selling his place for a, a potential record-breaking amount mm -hmm. And that is That's Rich for today. More on how the other half lives. These people aren't just rich. They're crazy rich. Next time on The Mark Thompson Show. Mm. At least someone's making money doing news, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think we can get rid of the uh, former federal David player. Katz? Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, what else do I need to do, Tony, before we say goodbye? We've got a big show tomorrow. Wow, is it Friday tomorrow already? So many man. people to still thank, I think. We oh, have really? I, I love thanking so many people that there are to thank. Pinky, $3.99, dollar a day Pinky steps out. up and Thumbs goes for up. a $4. Yeah. Awesome, Pinky. Thank you, Pink. Thank you so much to Gary Prosser, Super Sticker. Big shout out, Gary. Big awesome. shout out. And thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. Mm. John Woodard for the 10 spot. Thank you, John. Big, shout, Big out. shout out to you, and thank you so, so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. To everyone. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you, that's the one I want. Amy's got a good idea from earlier. She wants uh, the overlay of the president's audio over the football game. So, oh, that's you know. probably the way yeah. to watch it. Tonight, yeah. the president, Joe Biden, is speaking before the nation at 8 o'clock, and that will conflict the basketball game. I mean, the football game kicks off, I think, 15 minutes after that. 
Uh, not sure, but somewhere around there. So, yeah. Um, that is a clever idea. Yeah. Another clever idea from our audience. Yeah. So, as long as the Golden Bachelor isn't preempted, says <laughs> I know. Please. Keep that Golden Bachelor dream. He's so a hunky 72-year-old, right? And the um, thing about the Golden Bachelor, I haven't been watching it, but I guess it's different than the regular Bachelor in that the regular Bachelor is kind of rolling around with three or four of the contestants, you know. His yeah. future fiance is in one of the four, and he's got to road test them in ways that are, I don't sanction them, frankly. Yeah. But uh, in the new world, it's uh, we look the other way. But the Golden Bachelor, he comes from the old world, not the new world. No. And so the Golden Bachelor, he just wants to get to know people. He wants to crank up those hearing aids and be able to have a conversation. <laughs> so he's not rolling around with anybody from what I would guess. Is, am I right about that? Anybody in the chat can tell me we haven't, we could bring somebody on who can update us on the Golden Bachelor, but I really, we've been busy to other, yeah, he wants to chat, exactly, Julie. He's a chatter. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the Golden Bachelor, they will make plans for making sure you see the entire episode there on ABC, so you don't need to worry. Well, tomorrow is a big, big day. Um... Oh, Nikki is watching it. Is that right? Shadow producer Calvin Wong says yeah, Nikki's watching it. Yeah, she is watching it. Okay, she likes well, that's it. Cool. She oh, says he's really sweet, that um, he's kissed a couple of the ladies so oh, far. Oh, I hope his yeah. mom doesn't find out about no. that. That is really... No. Gotta yeah. do what you gotta do. How do they handle that meet the family? Have they met the family yet? The, uh... I don't know. It'll be Nikki. like meet the adult children, right? Yeah, we may yeah. have to bring Nikki on to talk about it. Yeah. Oh. Well, tomorrow it'll be everything going on in Florida, Friday, fabulous Florida. Michael Schur and Jim Avila will be here. We'll talk politics yeah. of the week, Jim Jordan, and what's going on with the multiple votes and the possible future. All of that. We'll talk Israel, and we'll talk Gaza. All of that tomorrow. And we will finish it all off with the Culture Blaster movies streaming what to watch we'll get to all of that tomorrow thanks for smashing the like button Smash it with your iron and all the ways you support us appreciate it so much and now i'm shadow stevens for the mark johnson show bye-bye the great shadow thank you everyone out of time bye bye well, the after party live starts now until tomorrow bye bye